Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. On this cigar-free episode, we've only done a few ever. I've already had a stick today. I didn't feel like doing another one. So I have been watching this amazing... I'm not done with it yet. I'm only two hours in. So this is going to be part one of a bonus round. I'm um, also going through Tesla's invention list. Oh my God. It's going to be so good. It's going to be so good to explain what this dude's done. Uh, but I can't di digress because no one knows that's coming. He doesn't watch the show normally. Watch this guy named Brian Forster and everything. Well, a bunch of new stuff I'm going to mention is credited, credited to him. I don't know if I'm going to cut in his um, images or not. Uh, I'm kind of debating. I, I don't want to do a disservice. I will be putting his video in the link down below to give you a chance to see part of it. Before we go to the next section, it's about seven hours, about six hours, 50 minutes, I think. So I thought about doing maybe two or three of these catch ups on this to see if I've come up with anything new. This will be definitely some new stuff in the area of ancient Egypt, as well as other other sites. But it's going to mix in a little bit of some of the DNA we've talked about from other shows about ancient Egypt and these, these cultures that have names that are, I think, completely misunderstood because we have been taught bad history. And, you know, I think that some of it's been bad history due to people just trying really hard and not being able to come up with any other ideas and you know, I want to make sure that, you know, we remember that a lot of times when we read about ancient, ancient stuff like the pyramids or Machu Picchu or um, other amazing locations, we lean on one PhD who was like the guy or girl who went in and first uncovered this stuff. And so, you know, they get to say... You know, and again, I think that a lot of these loan sharks, uh, uh, I shouldn't say I think loan sharks, different thing, but these kind of like solo guys or gals that go in, you know, they have however much history that they've been able to discern out of reality. You know, printed books were a little bit more difficult to get a hold of than internet websites that might have the book online, which is what it is today. If someone researches something, goes online first, then maybe it turns into a book later. And then the online version could be, you know, uh, thousands of hours of YouTube videos, whereas the book is only going to be capable of holding 400 pages or something like that, right? So the three areas that I'll go through today will be ancient Egypt's um, knowledge, the pre-Inca civilization, and Petra, because that's what he's covered in his his video. You know, obviously my knowledge is uh, has more of probably what he's going to end up talking about in his video but something's dawned on me because you know we've had graham hancock go first he wrote uh, fingerprints of the gods he wrote the book about the sphinx and then we had the pyramid code that came out in bbc which is now being sold or you know viewable on netflix which i think is unbelievably mandatory if you want to start getting a grasp of things and this is where so you have graham hancock finding hieroglyphs with years and months on them taking it back you know according to man you know pre-ice age then you have uh the pyramid code which finally was able to say that the pyramids were power stations. Then you have Brian Forrester, and I don't know exactly where he's going to end up, but he has alluded to the power supply. But what Forrester's done is uh, really get into the geology of the structures and the rocks that have been imported from, in some cases, 500 to 1,000 miles away at, you know, a thousand tons or more, which seems, you know, absolutely impossible. No matter what you want to do with some of these rocks, they're huge. And interestingly enough, for those of you in other conspiracies, 
a lot of it is uh, black boxes of these stones. And what he has done is he's looked at, he finally just said, this forester guy looked at the construction methodology and simply said, look, he, he, he introduced a, a rating system for rock, which I think was extremely powerful for the mind, which he said, look, all of the rocks that are a part of these monolithic structures from the past average of a hardness of seven out of 10, 10 being a diamond. And so the rule is in chemistry is that you have to have a harder substance to etch a, another substance, right? So an eight can etch a seven, a nine can etch a seven, a 10 can etch a seven. However, if you're going into the eight, uh, I would say seven, eight, nine realm, you're going to be dealing with rocks, other rocks, pounding rocks. And those rocks will deteriorate over time, especially if they're cut in a fairly sharp, wedgy way, right? You know, just you, know, you got a little spike and you're hitting it. So diamond is just the all end all beat all winning methodology, but then diamond cutting technology has a tremendous amount of requirements for invention and implementation. For instance, if you want to cut a stone with diamond, uh, one, we've only hit, we've had that technology less than 150 years in our realm. And this stuff goes back, you know, his, his date, just so that you know, is 12,000 years ago, which would take off the two that we've lived in the 80 realm. So he's talking about 10,000 BC. Um, he apparently in his narration has been talking about the ice age being a barrier in his mind. And I'm not convinced that ice ages happen anywhere near the way that they have been described because the places that they go to try and prove that ice ages occur are still very polar based regions of the world. So very close to the South pole, very close to the North pole. And so that doesn't infringe on constant invention at the equator, which is where Egypt is, right? Uh, I don't believe for a second that at the equatorial level that you got freezing temperatures. I just don't believe that. And again, it's because they found rocks that rolled, okay? And they've seen glass, uh, glaciers, I almost call them glaciers, the British way of saying it. So, you know, okay, so ice rolls a rock way up in, you know, some northern hemisphere region and to somehow create this, this intellectual barrier. It's almost like the flawed algorithm e equals mc squared. If you do the math on it, it says that nothing could go to the speed of light. Well, obviously, that's completely untrue. Certain things would definitely struggle to get to the speed of light, but pure energy most definitely can exceed that, ether being tested at 50 times the speed of light by Faraday through Tesla, and then reconfirmed in the late 70s, early 80s by Eric Dollard. So it's important to kind of flush out of your mind. If you're coming into the channel new, this, this title interests you. I need you to let go of things that like the Big Bang, just let go of it, right? It's not true. It doesn't, it defies all physics and nobody was there. It's just a way to make sure that the common person can go, I know how the universe started, right? It makes them feel empowered. If you take that away from them, then you leave them with doubt and uncertainty again, because they're usually not that intellectual. But even if you're massively intellectual, thinking about the beginning of the universe is something that, like thinking about infinite number sets, as I've said recently. But what this uh, Forrester guy did was focus on things that is in a book of mine called 39,000 BC, which is more around Graham Hancock's time frame, which is interesting to independent thinkers come up with the same number. Now, Graham, again, has been on... I think even the Joe Rogan show and brought photographs with him that they cut in uh, where he has a temple that takes back the dynasties way, way back there. Now, what Forrester does is very intelligent, which he has the dynastic time, which for those of you who are new to this whole thing, it's where the dynasties were. And then he has pre-dynastic era, which is things that were created prior to any Egyptian, uh, or sorry, any, excuse me, Arabic presence in the area. It's very apparent once you look at the busts of these individuals that they honored that they're, uh, they're, they're African. They're not 
I'm not saying it's uh, any one of the tribes that's in South Africa now or in the southern, or I guess the low, lower 90 percent, um, because the innovation has obviously been lost, right? But I think that they are direct, potentially uh, ancestors of those individuals. Who knows? Uh, but the Arab face is very different than an African, uh, which we call in America, black face, right? A black person. They have much different geometry. It's, it's all incredible. And so the busts are, you know, it does develop up to a Nefertini bust at one point, a head bust, right? But, you know, you have statues that are most definitely not of that genetic pool. And so his tact is many fold, but he starts his, it's a slideshow. He's sitting there talking to you. It's the easiest documentary I have ever watched on the subject, even though he's just sitting there talking, going through slides. The slides are intoxicating if you know what you're looking at. His presentation, he says nothing that doesn't need to be said, never repeats himself uh, unless he's demonstrating multiple issues with multiple slides. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, hats off to this guy. I don't know him at all. I should. But what he's done is he's looked at it from a geographical, or as I should say, geological uh, sensibility of the stones that were used. And then he looks at the erosion techniques. And then he looks at the tools that were used to create these objects. And then he brings in a whole new thing I have never seen before. Uh, and having said that, I probably have seen it and didn't recognize what I was looking at. And at first, when he started saying this on his presentation, I thought, oh, he's going to be starting to go into that, you know, fringy theory er uh, area. And then he showed three dozen slides proving his point. And you're like, oh, my gosh, you're absolutely right. And that is, is that there's essentially, um, I guess, about four, er four erosion techniques that you'll see. Uh, one is flood, flooding. The other one is sheer just wind without any other objects in the wind. Then there's sandblasting wind. And then there's this new thing, which is that a bunch of these structures are burned. And I mean, they have been burned at a thousand Celsius plus because these rocks won't respond to anything below a certain level of high temperature. In addition to his fire theory, because he's showing that um, some of these sites have all been essentially obliterated by what looks like a fire coming from one side, like almost like an atomic bomb. It looks like it has burned uh, one half of a statue. And then it's uh, the, the rubbling that's gone on at these sites. He's now postulating. And he said it was some other guy's theory that it was a plasma burst from the sun. Yeah, he might as well. Think about it like that. Uh, the sun is apparently 93 million miles away, so that would be pretty amazing. If it's a flat earth, then it's only 3,200 miles up, and then what's going on there? But the earth has enough plasma in its interior that they could have been f fiddling with the earth's interior like Tesla was fiddling with it to, you know, Tesla created a siphon out of the earth's crust of infinite energy, plasma energy. And then he was able to convert it into harm, harmless waves of energy so we could use induction to run all of our appliances everywhere in the world. And so, you know, the origin of the blast isn't as, as interesting to me at this point. And he, maybe he'll offer more theories later on, but he is absolutely correct all around the world even over in the kind of Machu Picchu areas of the world in, in Peru and in the, um, well, I think that Petra doesn't really have a tremendous amount of the burning thing, but he does, he does show that some of the Petra rocks, and this is the, if you're not familiar with Petra by name, it is that amazing relief. It's called the treasury, I believe in the side of the mountain. It was in Indiana Jones three, where he walked inside that chamber to then go through his three trials and uh, retrieve the um, the Holy Grail from the uh, Knight Templar dude in there, right? But what he mentioned about Petra, and we'll we'll skip back to Egypt after this, but he said Petra is seven miles long. He said there were 
he lost count. He said, look, there's at least a hundred different inlets in this place uh, from super fancy ones that look like the treasury to homes as the further you go down. But he said it could have been 200. He goes, literally, I just couldn't keep count of what I was seeing. He was so exhausted after exploring each one of these, you know, unique reliefs in the mountain that they said they had to rent horses to get back the seven miles. You know, like seven miles is not really that long to walk. You can do 11 to 15 at Disneyland, right? But he was just laboring to take all these amazing photographs. And I will compliment one thing about this guy over most photographers. Graham Hancock's really, really amazing at it. Uh, he, he and his wife do their photography. Brian and his wife do their photography. He is really great about taking pertinent photographs. He uses humans um, of, you know, average six foot height to um, stand in front of objects so you can get a sense of scale. But he, in his Egyptian uh, exploration, paid the extra money to get to certain sites privately. And so his analysis is undisturbed by tourists without, you know, he doesn't have too many guides. He also, when he gets to Petra, he starts to kind of talk about his guy. We went to Machu Picchu area in Peru. He starts talking about his guides and just generally what the philosophy was that was coming out of them. And so, so here's the, um, the super interesting thing initially is that the rocks he showed me, uh, in this presentation, these black boxes that they built. And for those of you who follow the Saturn worship, theories of the black box, you know, again, Saturn's probably a gas giant with, uh, you know, rings around it, but you know, earth doesn't look like, cause I've seen Saturn through a telescope with my own eyes. Okay. Uh, it does have, you know, gaseous clouds around it, you know, and imagine us living in a world where we always had cloud cover in these rings that go from top to bottom. Right. It just doesn't sound like a place you can live. Right. When you stare at earth from space or even a high altitude plane, one or the other, we have openings, you know, you can see the ocean, you can see a continent. Oh, there's a storm right there. There's a hurricane, right? If you were to cover earth with clouds all the way around it, you're starting to have a greenhouse gas system that would fry everybody down below. It just doesn't make any sense. Anyone lives on Saturn. So that's just for those of you who follow that really intensely, but he even got to the point where before we start talking about some of the construction techniques, that he, he brought something up that um, I think was fascinating. I've never heard anyone else say it. And of course, if you're with a lot of Egyptian um, archaeologists, or especially that crazy guy they finally fired out of the Cairo Museum, you know, everything's, you know, them, 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 them. You know, they just want to take credit for all of this engineering. But it's like, okay, dudes, if you had built, built the pyramids right now, you would have anti-gravity vehicles. You would be the, the mecca of invention, because if you had structural knowledge of this place and um, Pi figured out and all this other stuff, you're thousands of years ahead of everybody else, right? I mean, literally thousands of years ahead of everyone else. Now, his dates, which I have to trust his dates more for official history. When I studied Egyptology for six years uh, at a, an exhaustive pace, you know, I heard that the, the Mastabas were which is these old burial chambers that they used to dig in the ground. Very primitive, just almost looks like a shoe box with some walls in it. There's no doors or anything. You have literally put people in little chambers. He, he dude would kill all of his animals and put him sometimes the wives would go with them. And then you just cover it up and you build this little bunker. Extremely primitive. He, he said that, um, and, and so what I, you know, cause for me, it was that the pyramids were, were built between 3000 BC to about uh, uh, 2800 BC. He puts them at 2200 BC. So I must have had my numbers wrong because this guy definitely knows his stuff. And so he quotes that as bad history. He makes it very apparent in his presentation that this is what you've been told. We don't, we're not sure when. Again, he goes back to 10,000 BC. Whereas Graham Chapman has done an amazing job also 
visiting all the sites exhaustively several times, and he has it back to 35,000 BC, which coincidentally also aligns the stars of Orion's belt and Leo, the constellation of Leo, with the Sphinx. So that was interesting. The other thing that Graham Hancock submitted, which just for those of you interested in doing the deep dive, his book on the Sphinx, which I can't remember the clever name he came up with, but it's just Graham Hancock. Look up the word Sphinx and it's the book. He had the Sphinx completely diagrammed internally with all of its internal chambers and windows out of the body of the Sphinx pointing at various stars. Whereas this guy um, correlates with my findings, which is that no one knows if there's chambers inside there. They know there's a chamber underneath the paws and there are inlets into the Sphinx, but you're not allowed to go in there. So Graham, I don't know. I mean, Graham is not a, He's not a casual guy, you know, he doesn't just make up stuff. So he must have been either told something or maybe he got some privilege access that he's not saying. And just to kind of put a, um, another point on that, when I was working in the San Francisco area, south of San Francisco, about 30 miles, we had this Ivy League guy come through the company and he worked for us for a little while. And uh, he was a rich kid. He went to uh, Cairo, Egypt before he came back to the United States after he went to college. And he said that um, you weren't allowed to climb on the pyramid, but he slipped a guard like 20 bucks and the guy said, go ahead. He just crawled up the whole thing all the way at the top. So um, you can get to these privileged places in the past. Now today they have 20 foot walls around the Giza Plateau. Um, but this Brian Forrester guy actually bought a tour because they're now opening up the chambers underneath the plateau which is what the the pyramid code talks about what this mason who's an egyptian mason he talked about playing in those catacombs uh catacombs excuse me down below the giza plateau and said that there was a hexagonal um, pattern underneath the giza plateau that was full of water we know it's built on an aqua ravine and that plus the conductive stones above it spells electricity now, this Forrester guy also clarified something that I may have been quoting incorrectly from the Pyramid Code, but I find it hard to believe the Pyramid Code got it completely wrong. But apparently there's a lot more red granite as the interior rocks of the pyramids than I previously understood. Now, what I've been told is that there's a conductive limestone on the inside and non-conductive on the outside, plus all the corridors inside were built out of this red granite. That's what I believe the uh, pyramid code said. So all of that creates a battery because you have plasma energy coming up through the water catacombs, hits the water plateau. Remember, the Giza plateau is supposed to be taller than the pyramid. The pyramid's like 455 feet. It's just massive, right? But he talks about explosions. What he, he says that when he looks at some of these other pyramids, especially a step pyramid, that was created uh, from what we believe much, much later because the stones inside were extremely primitive. He said that uh, it looked like the top half of this step pyramid had blown apart. And if you think about it, you've got some pyramids, three of them, each smaller. One's supposed to be red, one's supposed to be white. I think it's white, red, and black is the colors. And they would stain it, you know, they would use uh, smoke to stain it black and they would, I don't know how they got red out of it, but it was explained in the, in the pyramid code, you know, pure freshly cut limestone in the sunlight would appear to be just utterly blindingly bright. Right. So you might just get white just out of straight limestone, but he talks several times and he was saying, look, the force to break up these stones, to hurl these stones from what they apparently seem to have originated from, because they match the ones that are on the pile way, you know, far away. He's, and he just says, look, the pattern just looks like an explosion. So he didn't show any photographs to really reinforce that. He would probably need a drone to honestly give us that view. Who knows if that's allowed. Apparently, based on the, uh, the book uh, 39,000 BC, they said that by the last decade 
that the Egyptian government had figured out that they got a bunch of like secrets lying all over the ground. That outside temples and outside these pyramids, there's a bunch of like throwaway stones. Not sure if they were functional at one point and then something got torn down or whether or not this was just a mistake and they just, uh, I broke that up, leave it right there. But it was so bad that you, when photographers were starting to notice all these boreholes and these diamond cut, circular blade cut, because we know what that looks like today. This is the crazy thing. We know what it looks like in the 20th century and above. And so to see these etching marks on stones that match exactly the way we cut, you know, your, your marble cabinet in your house or the marble in your bathroom or whatever, it's, it's like, oh, it's one of those. But how the hell did they do it so long ago? You know, but you were the 39,000 BC was able to get a lot of photographs, but at the same time, the photographers in that book were saying that they would actually have to kind of hold their camera, you know, like pretend like they're sitting down and not looking anywhere, just kind of looking off in the distance, but really they're snapping shots with the camera. Um, luckily digital cameras don't have film, so they can just rack up like 15,000 shots in one visit, switch the memory card, do it again. Right. So he, uh, this Brian Forrester guy, he really brings your mind straight to the evidence of um, some of these stones, okay, were again, a thousand tons or more, right? Big cubes of stone that he said the closest quarry for some of the stone was like in Turkey, which is a lot further from America and Europe, but from Egypt, it's, it's, it's not... A tremendous distance, but what boat could you build to hold a thousand tons? I mean, seriously, how do you move that thing? And what if you lost one? You, we'd probably find them on the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea if that was the way it worked. And maybe they're there too. But he insinuated that, um, and it's so clear. It's so freaking clear when he see when you see his uh, pictures that, and I've seen just so you know. I mean, like I don't know hundreds and hundreds of pages of hieroglyph photographs because I studied it. And he says, look, look at these hieroglyphs. These hieroglyphs look to cut by machine. And they're super deep, like perfect relief symbols of ancient Arabic. And then he goes, look at this stone right here. And it looks all, you know, like you and me using some chisel. And okay, what's that thing look like again? Okay, yeah, yeah. it just looks really gross and, and coarse. No precision whatsoever. The depth of the actual hieroglyphs is really maybe maybe a quarter inch. Whereas these other earlier stones, okay, are like an inch, two inches thick and absolutely mitered edges. I mean, it looks like it looks like a 3D model where you just get perfection because it's fake inside of a computer, right? So he shows us this um, this one site that has a bunch of really long corridors that are beautifully arched all the way and super deep, like 300 feet deep or so yards or whatever. And the precision of the actual tunnels is precise. I mean, just ridiculously perfect. Now, can you imagine us trying, let's say we had a tool. It's an 11, right? It can go right through all this stuff. But we're going to do it by hand. Is there any machines? Well, you, know, you can get some pretty good stuff going, chip, 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 chip. But eventually, with a with a arch ceiling going three hundred feet back, hell, even thirty feet back, we're not going to have precision because we're human beings. Even if we brought like a little, you know, ruler with us and we're trying to measure constantly, we're going to get it off. It's going to look human built. And there are a lot of those uh, sites as well. When you compare the two, then your mind starts blowing. But down at the end of these corridors are these big, giant, black cubes. They have these perfectly mitered corners. Like, it's one thing to create one corner. It's another thing to keep all four sides parallel. Plus, the top is perfect 90 degree angle. He said that some of these lids that they were creating back in the day, if they were to fall down into the slots, he goes, it, it's hermetically sealed. That's how tight these, uh, these giant humidors are, right? But he also noted that the etching on some of this 
So, well, etching in all these black cubes looks primitive and looks more recent, as if they found these cubes, didn't know exactly what they were used for, and then just started putting stuff on them. There was actually one cube that wasn't quite finished yet, and it was pushed way down the hallway and the lid was actually further down, like 10 feet further down the, down the hallway. And he was like, man, you know, it just blows the mind as to what, you know, how they get the lid further in. And then why did they stop in the middle of this whole thing? And he starts uncovering various regions of Egypt from the Valley of the Kings all the way up through Luxor up to the Giza Plateau. Where it really appears that they suddenly abandoned the place. Like something happened. Now, again, it does look like fire is present at the areas where there's no more life on the ground, except some kind of barby little bushes, but there's no uh, normal plants. There's no indigenous animals running around. And so he said, you know, there was this one area that looks like it was bombed, and then a second it stops life starts again like you have plush something or other living on this border of this particular area now the other th distinction he makes which i think um we've all made recently in the last five years at least as this new information keeps coming out is that you know one you're raised with wrong information and again there's a lot of pride for the egyptians to claim that all this is theirs, right? How convenient. Okay. It's not that, you know, they didn't do amazing things in addition to whatever they found, but it looks like all the most amazing things were created by this culture that was long gone. Like they found it and then they just claimed it as their own. Why not? It's what the Ptolemies did from Rome. But he said, look, we all know that if you subscribe to the electrical theory of the pyramids, which is not a stretch, I mean, it's not even, it's pure physics, it's pure, pure electronics, and not electronics, but uh, pure electricity, electrical theory. They tell you that these things were tombs. It, you know, I guess, you know, we, when you're kids, you look at the pyramids, you're like, tombs, what? And then you get older, and you're like, yeah. People do get really sentimental about you know, their leaders who die, especially if they were good leaders. But the interesting thing he noted right at the beginning of his presentation, which I've never had anyone say, is that he said, look, um, he says all these pharaohs that claim various pyramids, he goes, you know, the Great Pyramid is estimated between 2.3 to 2.5 million stones, all weighing, you know, 10 tons plus. And he said... Uh, now, some are 60 tons. I mean, they're just gigantic. They're huge. He said they would have to be placing a stone every two and a half minutes to get the thing done in the guy's lifetime. So the idea that these were built in any one pharaoh's lifetime is um, just a joke. It's just not true without special technology. Okay. And again, if, if they did it, then they did the most abysmal job ever in history of recording how they did it. Because I can tell you with every single hieroglyph I've ever seen, every book I've ever read that translated them for me, there's no knowledge of how these things are built. They didn't leave back, leave a schematic of how they, how they um, built these things. And you're thinking, well, what, what happens in the modern world? What happened with Greece? They advance, you know, they get the Parthenon and then it gets to Rome and then they create their columns and then it moves into Europe and they start creating more advanced things. Again, remember, the closer the pillars are in architecture, the more primitive the builders were at the time. And as the further they can build these pillars out, the more amazing the structure is because it has more structural integrity, right? So everyone else in the world, as compared to the Arab Arabs in Egypt, the Egyptians of today, they, they moved up after Europe moved up, you know? And so it doesn't make any sense when they were totally advanced. And now it's just kind of a third world, you know, especially today. So he tries to stress, look, just because someone said this was a tomb, this was a home, this is a sarcophagus, 
you have to take all of that indoctrination away. And then just look, just observe at what, you know, what you're seeing with your own two eyes for the tunnels. And this is a big thing about the pyramids as well, because he hasn't gone inside the pyramids yet. I hope he loops back in his, in his show. He said, look, the, we know what the indigenous people used for light. They had pretty advanced torches back in the day, but torches uh, burp out a lot of carbon. And so if you were to take one of those torches, let's just say your, your ceiling in your house wasn't flammable. Okay. But it's white. And you were to carry one of these torches just from the front door to your back door and back out to the backyard, you would have a candle burn on your roof, just from the carbon, just sticking to your roof. And so think about how long it would take for to build these structures by hand without amazing tools being there forever. So how are you going to clean it all up? I mean, you could potentially, okay, it makes no sense. And you wouldn't get rid of all the carbon because carbon sticks in every little nook and cranny. But you could, you know, technically go to the very end of the corridor with some torches and then polish your way out of the place, right? And then it's like, don't go inside because, you know, uh, the torch is going to make everything look bad. Doesn't make any sense. The pyramids internally have no scorch marks. But once you go inside, you, there's no light. You turn a corner and there is no light. There were old theories of mirrors, but then again, the technology of mirrors back in the day was um, very primitive for a very, very long time. Even polishing steel to cast light in. Um, we didn't have, we had Bronze Age stuff at best in the dynastic period, 2200 BC. So a lot of questions. But now some of the things that he's pointing at are the, he mentioned something I didn't know, which is these boreholes. It's weird when you grow up with technology and then you see it in prehistoric man, basically, right? And I don't mean unsophisticated man, because obviously they were capable of doing things that we can't do today. And that's just wild for the mind, isn't it? Your hubris won't allow it. Ah, oh, no way. You know, we know everything today. We got B2B bombers, you know. Okay. These boreholes are everywhere. Now, some of them, I think he, he um, may have mistaken for modern boreholes that were used to move things. Because he, he showed this one area where there was a rock on a, on a, like a pedestal. And it's a big, heavy rock. It's probably about a five-ton rock. And it had boreholes on both sides all the way through. Little tiny, you know, maybe like one inch or one and a half inch, two inch boreholes going all the way through. I would think that that's what they did in modern times to move it to that location. But the most important boreholes are ancient boreholes. Big quartz, baths. And when I first heard um, or first saw in this book of mine, you know, them really calling out the boreholes and the Egyptian or the, sorry, the pyramid code actually has a little bit of this in it, but my book went into it uh, a really intense rate. You still think there's a way of someone creating some sort of drill. Let's say, I mean, mounting diamonds on something. Okay. Part of it has to do with the fact that you don't just mount diamonds on other rocks and then turn it and create a, a drill. It would seem as if they, um, you have to mount it on something that's equally strong as the diamond, at least a nine to an eight to a nine in strength, because all that kinetic force, once you start banging it into something, right? All the kinetic force is pushing back against your diamond drill and it's going to start knocking the diamonds off if it's not mounted on something perfectly. And so I think that it just gets more and more mind blowing. But now he mentioned something that was something I didn't know, which is, I don't even know if this is true, but it sounds like it makes sense. He said, look, you can't do a diamond drill that has a variable speed. Otherwise you don't get perfect holes. So he said, you can't pedal you can't turn with your hand at some, you know, crank thing 
like those old those old drills you used to have you know when you were a kid from your grandpa's tool shop he says you can't do it that way and he goes some of these boreholes were about an eight inch diameter he stuck his hand in this one and it was like eight to ten inches and he goes this is a gigantic borehole and he goes just ask any engineer that does this type of work the difficulty of you know boring a quarter inch hole versus a 10 inch hole in a seventh strength stone like granite and again it just starts going oh my god you know what what must have been the situation and then this is where i'm going to put in some more of my own dna before we go into other little pieces here what starts to blow my mind is that obviously you think about these um people who were doing these amazing things i mean the stuff in peru is equally amazing these mitered edges that, that they came up with in stone was just unbelievably perfect but if you had the technology to create the tool to bore a hole in stone the big question is why are you using stone where is where are your other inventions that would um you know like skyscrapers or whatever now according to the discovery channel simulation of what the world would look like in 10,000 years they said that in their estimation new york city would atomize you know no human beings anywhere in the world it's just going to age he said that the plant growth will move into the city it'll turn all the roads over because it's just it'll eat them up it'll just atomize all the asphalt and eventually it just atomizes to like a dust you know i mean we might find like dust trails ten thousand years from now from a super highway that where you know archaeologically we could get in there and dig it out and go oh wow there's this weird stuff you know it's kind of rubbery you know whatever it is but they said that the 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 buildings, the skyscrapers made of steel would just rust away and fall into the ground. Very interesting, right? So it does baffle me that I can't reconcile my brain all of these amazing tools without the other side of the game. But, you know, again, it, it does demand a few inventions that I think um, changed their universe, right? They didn't have potentially, like, silicone chips and miniaturization and, and vacuum tubes and resistors and transistors and all that kind of stuff so you know there's definitely limits perhaps they hadn't um completely figured out a combustion engine that kind of thing but they had oil that would burn of course and so that's a little side thing to my brain that i'm trying to figure out but the other side of the game would be as I've said before, uh, this this alien theory, right? And the alien theory when I was a kid was aliens are over here and human beings are over here. We're not the same thing. And as you grow older and you start looking at, uh, you know, anthropological studies, uh, genetic studies, you start to find out there's some pretty weird stuff inside the human body that looks very, very deliberately engineered and the one example i give often on the show is that the visual cortex of the human brain is five layers of cells and the first the only part that we use is the half of the first layer because there's a blocker in there that keeps our signal from traveling the rest of the four and a half slices meaning someone did this to us it doesn't make any genetic sense whatsoever why this blocker would be there like, why would this other similar, well, identical tissue ever develop if it was, if it wasn't being used, right? Evolution doesn't do that. If you build it, you use it. Yeah, there's the uh, appendix and the gallbladder, which has marginal use at this point. But your visual cortex, come on, we use that all the time. We're not eating rocks anymore. So those other two organs, you know, have minimal use. So, you know, when you look at the alien side of things, then you start to have to start reconciling this notion, which is um, if we were them, and I won't spend a tremendous amount of time on this because I have whole episodes on this subject matter, but just to kind of lean into this a little bit as we're thinking about the other things, is that perhaps we are them. 
you know, maybe there's different races of us out there in the universe. The other theory is that they might find a, uh, amphib well, sorry, um, a primate or a hominid of some sort that's indigenous and already, you know, acclimated to the, the, um, oxygen that we breathe, the food supply that's on earth. And then over time, genetically splicing us, their DNA with the local DNA to create some sort of hybrid. It would seem that if they had enough technology to get to planet earth, simply re-engineering themselves to match whatever's available would be child's play for someone of that technology level. So maybe there's no splicing. And then it could be that even um, prehistoric man, which would be a bipedal creature that perhaps would have been a threat to them on a, hey, we need to get our act together and figure out how to live on this planet and stuff. Maybe they strictly annihilated them personally, at least, you know, you could wipe out the hominids completely. So there's no Bigfoots anywhere as far as um, any big population of a predator. They just wipe them out. Or they cut back the numbers so bad or even genetically change them such they can't leave the jungle. They can't just be anywhere, but we can't sort of thing, right? But they built things out of stones all over the world. So let's just say that they can move stones. I mean, I'm kind of dismissing as well as kind of pushing into your mind potential possibilities. But the one thing against aliens like literally from outer space coming down and building all this stuff is that why would there ever be an unfinished obelisk why would there ever be an unfinished stone because with their technology maybe i'm over assuming they should be able to crank these things out very quickly again with that guy's point about the 2.3 million stones which is what i was always told he he averaged up another 200,000 potentially is that, uh, you know, he said, look, every two and a half minutes, you put that together and you know, you're going to have a long life lifespan there. So, you know, it would be something that if they couldn't build it that quickly, which that's insanely fast, no matter how, what kind of construction site you're dealing with, then it took a long time to build. It doesn't have to be slaves or anything like that. Sometimes people just do good things because it's what's cool, man. Hey, you want to build the most amazing structure on planet Earth? World world wonder number one? Yeah, sure. Can you give me some food? Absolutely, man. Okay, let's do this. You know, My research into Egyptology, again, put the average human in Egypt at the pre-dynastic times and dynastic times at around 70. The pharaohs, some of them have been estimated in their mid-90s. And so, you know, all that stuff about us living shorter lives, that's more of a European bubonic plague sort of thing. Or maybe even some of the rougher Roman eras where, again, everyone's going off to war and dying or they don't understand how to keep, their, keep themselves clean. But there are countless boxes in Egypt. And they're always called sarcophagus. Sarcophagi, I guess. And... You know, he's like, well, you know, they could be, they could be used as tombs, but he goes, look, he, he puts a slide up there where he shows an old box and then an older box. And he goes, look at this one right here. He goes, this one's more recent. And it's, it looks like a man did it. It's all round. It's got all, you know, there's nothing precision about it. There's no mitered edges in or out of this thing. It looks like a bathtub created by rock, rock, uh, you know, hitting sort of techniques, right? Chiseling. And then there's this black version of a box right next to it, which is as close to human, well, I mean, it's close to perfection in the universe as you could possibly make an object. It is perfectly mitered. The the lid on the box, mat, it's, it's the same stone. They just somehow figured out a way to clear cut this thing. Unbelievable. Uh, the book that I read and... I think Graham Hancock has talked about there's there is a box out there. I tried to find the picture of it. And it's a perfectly mitered box about the size of your average cooler. Big cooler. 
And the box has, uh, in fact, I think it was his Joe Rogan thing, but it has four little pegs attached to the lid. And then the body of the box uh, has four little inlets where these notches will come down. He said the crazy part was, and he had these zoomed up photographs, what I saw, he put the lid down on the box. And when they looked at the, the geology of the rock, really, really close, the composition of the rock, they found like a circle of some of the embedded pattern that was continuous between the two sides as if something laser cut this thing clean across, but was able to leave the pegs. So imagine that. How do you cut a peg? inside of a rock down below by etching from the outside. I mean, it's like, it's mind blowing technology, right? But he said that if you don't spin a diamond bit at the same RPM with a motor, he goes, it will not look correct, which means they had some sort of motor that was constant. Well, those of you who have looked at these hieroglyphs, which appear to show like a uh, like a like an assistant to the um, pharaoh, which they'll always call a slave, yeah, he's holding these big giant light bulb things, and they're big giant. Um, looks like if the dude was six foot, this thing is probably eight foot, and inside there's like a serpent wiggling to the center of this bulb-looking object, very much like a filament in an old Edison light bulb. And it looks like these things were lights. Now, today, if you were to make a bulb out of our current technology and try to hold it, why don't it be so blinding you would, you know, have to drop it and run away, but it would also be so thermally hot that you couldn't hold it. So I think we need to dial back our interpretation of what a bulb would be if these are indeed bulbs, because what would you be doing holding these and they're all over the place in some of these hieroglyphs collections these big bulb things with these big serpents in the center it couldn't be that bright you know bright enough i help maybe just the tip of the tongue of that serpent is the part that's shiny and just remember serpent worship is all over the world uh, the pharaohs put the cobra right over their third eye and we know dragons are in china and japan and there are plenty of serpent statues in South America. And so obviously it was a formidable creature. And to claim any sort of symbolic uh, dominance over the one of the sneakiest predators, right? A bite can kill you. Cleopatra had her boob bit, right? And, and by the way, uh, what is it? Um, Charlotte Johansson is playing Cleopatra in the new movie. And this new round of protest is coming out that how dare a white girl play Cleopatra? She was a black lady. And I hate to inform anyone who believes that, that Cleopatra was a ninth generation Ptolemy Roman white girl. Okay. Really sorry. Study your history. Okay. But now the book that I have has all kinds of amazing edge work that when I have to do 3D and I'm doing like a pillar or some wild, you know, spaceship thing that's on the wall. There are tools to create these beautiful beveled edges as well as mitered edges. And the, the easy one to do, just so that you know, is a perfect, in tools of today, okay, is a perfect 90 degree angle because a lot of tools that are made to do mitered 90 degree angles. Uh, doing a bevel, a nice kind of graduated curve, right? Pretty easy with the tools that we have today. What is not easy today is to create an organic, or organic curve that has a bevel to it. Meaning like if you were to do a statue of a woman lying down, okay, so that amazing profile of a woman's body, you know, from her shoulders down to her waist, up over her hip, down her thigh, a few changes in trajectory, trajectory from the thigh to the leg to the foot. That's why people are master sculptors and modelers and stuff, because that's hard. Okay. Well, when we look at the, the full blown statues that the Egyptians put together, this very African composite of the face, they're doing, they're doing exactly that. But again, researchers have now discovered that their discipline for creating the human form 
was always to embed Pi wherever you possibly could. It was as if it was an addiction to them to use spheres and circles. And, and even if they needed to change the trajectory, all of the trajectories would fall into some other sphere that's a part of the overall face. The level of just ingenuity to come up with that discipline prior to actually executing it on a head. And some of these heads are 12 foot wide, you know, 10 feet tall, and you can take them in Photoshop, straight on picture, cut one of the half of the face off, throw it away, and then mirror the other side of the face and it looks perfect. And it matches up with the part you threw away. What's exciting about this whole thing is what the hell was going on on earth prior to all of the seemingly primitive cultures that swelled up that became us. How did we lose all this tech? He goes off to Peru and it wasn't on Machu Picchu. I forget the name of the place. He's kind of bouncing around quite a bit and just some places he said that even the locals didn't know existed. And it matched everything I had seen before and everything I've ever told you. I have an episode called monolithic structures, I believe is the name of it, but it, uh, they have these amazing stones, right? And they're from far away. That's another thing. I mean, it's just the whole idea of just moving a stone is one whole mystery that these guys don't have time or a methodology to even, they haven't found the thread to pull the sweater out just yet. Okay, you can you can go with those old theories when I was a kid that they rolled um, a couple of theories was that they put logs down and then you just keep putting a log in front of the stone and just keeps rolling. Like, okay, you know, thousand tons though. What's that log made out of, you know? The other one is this, uh, there's a hieroglyph of this, but it's, it's not pre-dynastic hieroglyph, unfortunately, which is this notion that you can, and I've seen it try to be simulated and it's sort of a huge joke that if you have a sled with a big, heavy stone on it, um, I think the smallest stones on the pyramids can survive this theory, but it is so illogical and uh, we'll just go through it. You put it on a sled and then you pour water on the sand in front of the blades of the sled. There's like a sled that Santa rides, right? And you can pull it along the, uh, the sand. Okay, this is definitely a lusher area back then than it is today. The Nile has actually moved several miles since back in those days, which we can see geologically speaking. But I mean, that's a lot of hauling water, man, you know, for one stone, it, it is going to be sand at one point, you know, and you're, that's the theory you're pouring it on sand. And so sand's going to eat up water like crazy. So how do you have this constant flow of water without an aqueduct, without some tubes, you know, that are very malleable so you can move them around and spray them you'd have to have buckets and buckets of millions of these buckets man you have to have a row taking them back to the to the nile and then back up i'm not saying it's impossible but there does come a point where sand goes away and now you're on the plateau okay and then the plateau goes away because you're starting to move the stone higher and higher and higher on the pyramid yeah, sure. You could do levers and, you know, potentially some, some theories about how this works. I think that what those theories lack is any theory of efficiency that would last. Like if you slowed down the process, remember the guy said two and a half, every two and a half minutes, you'd have to put a stone down to um, finish a pyramid for Kofu or, you know, any one of these guys that says they built the pyramids. Well, they're going to be dead before the thing is finished. So if you start introducing levers and pulleys and all this other stuff, then you're talking about a mess. It's going to slow down every stone to like hours. So you can't finish this thing in a hundred years now because you got a big problem. So I want to throw out, you know, one more sort of theory before we move on, uh, which I have sort of mentioned, I think in a more brutal manner because it was occurring to me during the episode. But um, what if you had a time machine, you go back and uh, they're there, you know, you're not sure what year it started, but you go there and they're fresh. They're nice. They look really good. And the people are definitely not the current Egyptians it's the pre-Egyptians, pre-dynastic period folks. And you go, 
Do you know how these things were built? Oh, yeah, totally. Well, how did, how do you move these big, heavy rocks? And they look at you kind of funny. And say, what do you mean? Well, these things are like really heavy. How the hell did you move them? There's millions of them in there. What do you mean by heavy? And they go up and they grab a rock that should weigh four or 500 pounds, right? And they just hand it to you. And like, you mean that? And you're holding this rock. And back in their era, didn't weigh as much. But how's that possible? Am I just making something up? No. The idea is, if the Earth was a little early in its development, it has to do with you know a bit of that uh, Coral Castle guy's uh, my, my theory on his thing. But what if the world was burping through a meridian line? Energy, energy that flowed up out of the bottom of the earth or the center of the earth. And it just so happened to resonate with, with those particular rocks, the limestones of the world, because Kroll Castle is actually technically a limestone. And maybe granite's affected as well. And these stones just aren't as heavy as they are today. Who knows? You know, again, we don't know when these things were built. And again, no glacier is going to be reaching Egypt, no matter what theory they give you about the Ice Age. It's not going to reach. In fact, this guy, this Brian Forrester guy, if anything, his, his issue is fire. Now, the fire thing is super interesting, the way that he has filmed the rock, because he shows you these amazing scorches on the rock, and he quotes this um, geological data they said essentially this rock and a couple different um, uh, structures, both structures and statues, flaked. It started flaking off. Almost like you're peeling paint off of, you know, some other structure. Where the structure is made of one thing, the paint's made of paint. And he said, look, in order for this to start flaking, you have to expose this particular type of rock to a thousand degrees Celsius or higher to get this start, sort of erosion to occur. And I'll be damned, man, he filmed temples. He filmed rocks on the ground that are, you know, broken off from something else, statues that have been knocked down, obelisks. And they're just, uh, some of them have these massive scorching on them. Now, if a rock that's fallen down and moved around, we don't know what angle it was at when it all occurred. But for the structures that are there, it appears that a blast came from a particular direction. And Neil, I don't want to say the direction, but it's one of the south, north, east, west angles and not the other ones. It doesn't account for in any way, shape or form these tools. Now, one of the other big tools that we see is, and we see it all over the place. We seem to see it in Petra. We seem to see it in uh, Peru. Our circular saws with apparently some sort of diamond level 10 hardness bit that is just eating up these stones like no problem. That's a little strange. The bigger the diameter of the cuts, and I have seen in the book I have like massive diameters of what these blades would have to be. And we're talking about like a table saw turned sideways or turned straight up and down or whatever, and it's cutting these things. And it would be, I mean, gosh, you're talking about some of these blades being anywhere from six feet to 10 feet in diameter. But there are plenty of rocks at these structures that have absolutely no cut marks whatsoever, but they're most definitely cut. He, he showed this paramoridian stone, which is the tippy top stone to a pyramid. It's got all four sides on. It's like a little mini pyramid and you put it on the top. They had found... The Egyptians had found this perfectly black, polished stone. I mean, it was unbelievably beautiful, polished. And he said, look, for you to polish this stone, to have this sheen on it, and all the edges are perfectly beveled, just beautiful, tiny bevel down the side. Because once you polish it like that, it, its structural integrity is huge. You know, if you have a little cut into the stone surface, to its raw unfinished surface, then water can get in there, air can get in there, just erosion can occur. 
But then it had a little band of hieroglyph across the bottom. And he said, look at the hieroglyphs. The hieroglyphs are really primitive. I mean, just they do. They look like crayon versions of the other stuff. He says, I'm going to tell you right now. He goes, that was put on after they found the stone. Because whoever has the technology to create this stone is way ahead of this crappy etching on the bottom. Now, so far, he hasn't mentioned anything about the pyramids having colors. I'll be, I'll be very interested when he hopefully loops back to the pyramids if he actually acknowledges that. But he gets over to Peru. And what's cool about the Peruvians is that in all the research I've seen, they immediately say, we didn't create that. We created that repair. So you have this beautiful wall, you know. And again, Machu Picchu is supposed to have corridors where for years they just looked at them and said, this is amazing. There's no mortar between these rocks. They fit so perfectly. They look like they look like they were one rock and then someone just created faux indentations that they were actually individual rocks, that they're not individual rocks, but they absolutely are. And they're like three feet thick and it's perfect all the way through. But a dude who was researching that said, um, he finally noticed that when he was in the corridor and looking around, just trying to find something new, you know, he looks left, sees a pattern, and then he looks right and he sees the inverse pattern on the other side, mere imaging the corridor. Meaning, if you've ever looked at one of those Machu Picchu walls, you would think that, oh, you know, okay, it looks like it's really hard, but they're randomly picking rocks and, you know, it's got to have a certain size and they're doing this cut technique and they just kind of fit it on top of the other rock <laughs> absolutely not it's very specifically a pattern to create an earthquake proof wall because that area shakes a lot the other just you know amazing thing that you'll see a lot in peru are these mitered windows doorways a lot of the doorways are kind of trapezoidy, you know, so the top of the door um, the, uh, width is a little bit smaller than the bottom. So it kind of creates this cool angle uh, from an architectural standpoint that is essentially a square arch. It is a great design to distribute weight uh, and vectors so that they don't, you know, come to a point and just blow up a particular part of the structure. But... In his photographs, he has these burn marks on the walls here and there. And, you know, most of us would look at burn marks on the wall and just go, hey, maybe they had just a campfire right here. Maybe they had a torch on the wall right there. Where the hell they would have put it, I don't know. And so for, you know, a century or two, maybe they just put a fire right there. But what he proves by analyzing the rock and then studying how the rock got damaged by the fire, he's letting you know that this requires massive temperatures, you know, at Kelm level, which a torch is never going to get to Kelm level. It would melt itself. And these are external structures outside. Now, the other thing that if you study Inca technology and pre-Inca technology, you will always see a beautiful wall that's this crazy, amazing architecture. And some of it's uh, pillowed. It's a pillow bevel embossment so these rocks are not only fit together but they kind of have a pillowy soft a very nice aesthetic right and then if you look up a wall usually if there's been any damage to the wall any rocks that are missing you will have um uh these just like people just setting stones down you know it looks like you and me fixing a wall and the incas that are there were like yeah that's us right there that's us doing those repairs. All that other beautiful stuff is from the culture that we don't know anything about. So what's nice about Peru is that they're upfront about what they made and upfront about what they discovered. Whereas Egypt tries to take credit for everything, but doesn't have any of the technology today to do it. Now, Peru has the technology that matches their repairs, right? Egypt is in the Stone Ages compared to what the technology was to build the pyramids. But now, these black boxes. So I told you about some black boxes in these uh, tunnels. The other black boxes they found were in these catacombs underneath the Giza Plateau, which dropped 
gosh, like um, several hundred feet down under the ground. And so these catacombs aren't just like holes dug in the ground, right? It's not just like you and I dig in a well and then, oh, let's just lower ourselves down in there and the rock could cave in on us, right? No. These are, you know, mitered big ass stones that create the shaft that you go down inside of. He said some of these shafts are like, you know, 16 by 16 feet, which is a trim. And then the walls, you know, who knows how deep the walls are? Maybe they're three feet thick. But it's just, again, that classic asymmetric, amazing design all the way down. And it seems like it has logic to it. You know, they, it well, I guess in America today, if you were to ask a mason to come create a wall for you, and he's a really great mason, if they want to do the um, corner of your house, they're going to stack rocks, you know, one over the other to create the corner. But they're all going to be the same size brick, right? What the pre-dynastic people did was they actually created corner rocks, rocks that actually change directions. It's all one rock. It's like a corner rock. It's almost like a corner piece of a puzzle. It's only ever going to be the corner piece. You can't ever put the corner piece anywhere else in the center, right? So that just shows a tremendous amount of planning and just architecture, man. If you see this stuff and then you go, ah, big deal, because today I see it all over the place, which you don't. But even if you were to come to that false conclusion, like a lot of us do, then you have to go back to 10,000 BC and go, okay, they did it right there. Now, how many centuries, millennia did it take for them to get to the architectural knowledge? to even attempt it in the first place. And so again, you know, that's why I don't you know, keep the ice age out of the conversation because this was a pristine, perfect place to start a civilization. I don't care if you're an alien dropping us off as cousins or we're hybrid spliced or we just happen genetically. Something amazing took place a long, long time ago. But he gets to the bottom of the shaft, which I believe was over like almost 60, like a couple or 100 drops. So they're almost 300 feet underneath the ground. If I got that number right. And there's a black box down there. And you're like, what? One of those big, giant, thousand ton black boxes is down there. And you know, there's this weird black box, black box worship, you know, when they do Mecca. There's the black box in the center, uh, which is uh, what do they call it, the Arab Spring, right? There's the black box they all walk around. Then inside that, there's supposed to be another like meteorite that's down underneath there. That's what they're actually worshiping. Um, I don't know what the Hasidic Jews are doing, but they do have a ritual where they wear little black boxes on their foreheads. So it's like something, something going on there, some ancient stuff. And again, for those of you who are really into the planetary theories that there's life on all the planets. Um, it's called Saturn worship, even though NASA screwed up and rendered a hexagon on the top of uh, uh, Saturn a long time ago, which now they have to keep that because they made a mistake a long time ago. Oh, we got a clearer picture now. It's no longer a hexagonal up there because we had bad circular mathematical algorithms. It's so funny. But then he goes to Petra. And Petra, I I knew it had several of these um, reliefs that are very much like um, the treasury. I believe I'm calling that the right name. They've even turned one of the little installations into a bathroom, which is kind of funny. What I didn't know was that there were so many, so many of these things. And so what he actually estimates, which I think is... Pretty dead on, but he didn't explain all of the amazing reliefs of this thing. Is that the um, the treasury, which has a massive amount of ornateness in the front? It looks like Greece. It looks like um, Rome. You know these these columns. My, my my big question about Petra is, what the hell were you emulating when this was created? If this is an ancient place, then how come it looks like you know? Greece or Rome. So he, he has an explanation that they actually, when they found this location of Petra with, you know, hundreds of these inlets, uh, carved out of the, 
of the stone. And we're talking about, you know, the average room in one of these, like if you were to go into the treasury and you go into the back, he says there's a room back there with uh, 360,000 cubic feet behind the treasury inside. And then he goes, what's even more remarkable is there's another chamber below this chamber. It's another 300,000 plus cubic feet. <laughs> it's just like, you know, and so the big question is, why do these things exist? You know, the pyramids, we can say energy source. The temples, according to the locals, are actually hospitals or dwellings. But Petra, hmm. He starts looking at the stone and he starts just very easily right in front of your face. He's, he starts, um, showing you the difference between what probably the locals found and started repairing as well as hiring people from Europe to come and do additional repairs. And then there's this weird thing. He says fairly nonchalantly because he's so immersed in this i don't think it's a big deal to him but to me it was a big deal he said you know and i, I take it this guy's been all over the world he said um every time that these cultures find something a pre-existing ancient culture he said they they will worship it they'll clean it up they'll restore whatever they possibly can and live in it and the big question there is, why? You know? And you might think, well, of course they would do that. I mean, it's amazing, right? Well, yeah, that's probably a big part of it. But what if you and I found a pre-existing, let's say you and I find Atlantis. We find Atlantis, and it's there's no one there anymore. And a bunch of it's still okay, and a bunch of it's damaged. Well, the reason why we would want to improve it would be probably um, emergency repairs, make sure nothing falls, maybe even hurts us. But two, because we know this is a sacred place, that an amazing culture created this because we know we didn't. And you would restore it. Now, the restorations are always extremely evident because they're bad. I mean, hats off to them for trying to make it better. But it's always just absolutely noticeable. He just showed photograph after photograph. He, might, he must have went through three dozen photographs of Petra. And you can just see. You start developing the eye for it. You know, he teaches you and you start, oh yeah, I can totally see. And then he starts to show you the erosion. And he said that Petra has flash floods to this day. And so he goes, the floods are about get anywhere from six to ten feet deep. And so you will have for the first six to 10 feet of a lot of locations that are elevated, uh, clear water erosion. And he says that, um, he says horizontal erosion is typically sand and wind. He said vertical erosion is almost always, um, uh, water running down. And that's how we know that the, uh, the uh, Sphinx is so old. And of course, you know, um, the we have to play this game. I think Petra is technically in Jordan. But we have to play this game where you don't want to insult the locals too much with new theories because they'll start shutting you down because you're removing their usurpation of other people's accomplishments. And this is, I don't know of any place more prevalent than Egypt of this particular situation and you may have genuine people that are simply raised with that knowledge and and then they just you know you just resist what you don't want to hear and so it could be a portion of that uh involved as well but there were you know inlets at a frequency that does look like um it could be dwellings but the big question is wow this is a tremendous amount of work to create a home. And so, you know, is it Dresden where this Petra is full of like all of the architects, all the people that invent this stuff. And so, you know, if you go into like in my community, if you go to the uh, neighborhood, which has a lot of our immigrants from Mexico, 
their lawns are perfect. Their houses are perfect because that's what they do. They make those things, um, they polish all day long. Other people's stuff, so they polish their own too, right? So perhaps, maybe. It does look like the further that, he said that the funny thing about Petra is that you, they said that you'll walk about a mile in to get to the treasury. And he goes, people just walk in that mile, see the treasury and turn and leave. And he goes, there's six more miles. And he says, those six more miles are everything when you're trying to figure out what the hell this place is, which most people aren't, right? You understand. They do have installations also in Petra where they've simply dug out that 300,000 square foot or cubic foot, excuse me, um, room. And there's nothing there. In fact, there's no veneer on the outside. You don't have to walk through a fake building to get in. It's just a big, perfect square. Uh, cut into the side of the mountain and he took this photograph of his wife for scale showing how big the room was and it was it was oh gosh i mean it must have been 30 foot ceilings at least and here's the thing here's the thing just blows the mind to pieces sorry i got mosquitoes in there i gotta keep watching looking them away I'm not trying to wave to everybody but the edges of this room are perfectly mitered the back wall, the ceiling, all mitered, beautiful. And because the stone is so gorgeous when it's cut in, you know, cross section, the ceiling's like this swirl of all this crazy rock. I mean, give me a break. Some people, I guess, live in these dwellings as it's allowed by the Georgian government way at the end. Um, so, so it was a goat farmer there. He keeps uh, his goats inside one of the buildings. But the erosion towards the last half of Petra is extremely telling. Because you might have somebody look at something and say, um, oh, look at that erosion on the rock behind um, that surrounds the, uh, the Sphinx. And you might look at that and, oh, well, maybe not, maybe, but, you know. The erosion at Petra in the last five miles is so evident that you have stone. And by the way, uh, Petra is... Um, apparently, um, sandstone, which would be extremely easy to etch with bronze. But his wife, I guess, is the geologist on his team. And he said that she said that this, I forgot the name of it, but is translated into a, um, a sedimentary sandstone, which is a level seven stone now because i guess it's been you know it's been on earth for so long that i guess it just keeps settling and settling on a microscopic level to the point it hits a seven and she goes this is not sandstone and goes, you know you just feel it it's not sandstone sandstone literally you could just etch it with your finger you wouldn't be able to let tourists there because they would be able to scrape something off everywhere they went apparently again you're not allowed to go inside the the indiana jones one anymore for just erosion purposes which is smart of them but these openings, which again, closer to the treasury, are more mitered. The etchings, or sorry, the openings at you know, the last five miles, it starts getting super round. And it's all erosion, which is fantastic for us because it starts to give us the indication of how old these rocks are. And I know that there's a lot of um, scientists claiming that they can age the patina on a rock because that's very handy for people that want to keep Stonehenge really, really old. Uh, and, and a bunch of other sites. Uh, you know, these things come into vogue. They age a bunch of stuff. And then 10, 20 years later, they're like, oh, yeah, that technology was all crap. You know, it wasn't really what we thought it was. And so we don't know how old all this stuff is. But erosion is amazing because erosion is mathematical. It takes a certain number of years to create this certain type of massive erosion that's in Petra. And he actually filmed a, a plaque, he took a picture of this plaque, which was saying that one of the structures he was looking at was created in 25 BC to 20 AD, somewhere in there. Which, you know, it's 2000 years. So, you know, it's definitely going to account for a little bit of the erosion, but again, he keeps taking pictures all the way up this trail and he starts to show you that the Romans showed up and created certain structures is very um, key ways. For instance, we all know that Romans and the Greeks, when they created pillars, they created slices of pillars and kept stacking them up on each other. Right. 
create the Parthenon. They never were creating a full pillar out of one piece of stone. One, it gets massively heavy and, uh, you know, just where do you find that kind of pristine stone the whole time anyway? So he showed this one inlet, which wasn't uh, terribly large, but you know, I think it was probably uh, 12 feet um, high with an inlet that went in about another 12 feet at least, probably a little bit more than that. But there was five pillars holding up this edge. And he goes, um, these look identical, right? And you're looking at them, and you know, at a casual glance, you're like, yeah, yeah. And he says, well, the three pillars on the right are original pillars carved out of the stone that was actually a part of the stone above and the stone below. So they weren't moved into place. They were start, you know, carved straight out of there. He goes, the two on the left were restored, probably by the Romans. Because the two on the left are stepped pillars of, you know, cylinder, 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 cylinder. So immediately you see the seams and you're like, oh yeah, oh my gosh, they did an amazing job making these other two look like the other three. And then he starts taking close-up pictures of the other three. And you start to see this raking tool that they were using to create this perfect roundness. The thing is, is, you know, and again, I, I coming as a complete, um, neophyte to carving stone with uh, tools, but it seems as if the, you know, the pillars are never like you make them in 3D as a novice where you have the same diameter all the way up the pillar. If you look at an Egyptian pillar, for instance, ones especially that hold up the temples, they're, they're tapered, you know, they have a really thick base and then they kind of get lighter and lighter as they go up, not too much, but a little bit. And of course, you have all kinds of um, palm plumes and stuff etched in there. And so I don't know how a human being creates these objects with utter perfection. The The raking on the pillars looks a lot like, uh, this is a silly analogy, but it's it's what, what I thought of when I thought about, okay, it looks like, okay, maybe you use machines to make this thing. You know the, the machines that strip um trees in the forest for for lumber you know creation they'll grab the tree and they slice off the bottom this big blade goes boom and chops it off and then it sucks it through this conveyor belt that's a part of this machine it just strips off all the branches and now you have this perfect telephone pole ready to go it almost looks like something of that nature with these diamond bits that is just simply stripping this apart because the interesting thing about the pillars and their etchings was that if you truly had all this um, easy peasy sandstone, you wouldn't have any etch marks because you might etch away with a coarse tool. And all you got to do is just take some stones. When I was a little kid in Kansas, there's a ton of sandstone. It's one of the most fun rocks to play with as a child because you can get a piece of sandstone and carve it into a car in just a few minutes. You know, it was always... Um, brilliant to play with and it was always super smooth you could get another sandstone and carve a sandstone with it or especially if you got a heavy rock no problem because sandstone is very pliable i guarantee you if petra was made of sandstone petra would be um just destroyed it would have fallen apart and definitely if anything was still in place you wouldn't be able to allow humans by it because you know it could fall so I'm going through this documentary. It's just blowing my mind. It's nice to know because I create, well, I do, you know, research like any of you, I go deep into these subjects and then I get a little concerned that, you know, maybe I latched on to something that doesn't really pan out, but to see a, uh, I don't even know when this was published. It just came across my feed yesterday and I locked it in for, to watch it later. Um, to see that this is still moving forward, that this, you know, these early archaeologists are helping the world open their minds so that we can get to the next theory. Because at some point we have to, I mean, there's, there's two sides to the equation, which 
um, Brian is extremely good at reinforcing as he goes through the presentation. Hopefully there's a big grand finale, which I can bring to you at a future time. Again, you're going to have a chance to watch this today because I'm going to link it down below. But again, it's seven hours. So depending on your regiment, it's going to take a few days to get through it. But you have fabrication questions. And the fabrication questions have to do with um, why and then how. And then you have use, utilitarian questions. Why? Why did you make these things? Again, pyramids, if they're truly what we think they are today, big power sources, that's great. Why is Petra like Petra? Why is Machu Picchu like Machu Picchu and all these other things? Uh, one of the things he did in Peru, by the way, was he found a lot of what looked like, uh, well, definitely um, Inca uh, walls and things where they're really just, you know, rocks stacked up on each other, what they call dry stacking. And then in the center of like a wall that they may have built was a pre-Inca structure where it's it's a little home, but these rocks are perfectly mitered, you know, perfectly smooth. And, you know, in my Egyptology um, experience, you know, you have a rock that might be 60 feet long with less than a 500th of an inch deviation in its surface. Okay, take an inch and try to cut that baby into 500 pieces. Good luck. You're going to have to use some microscopic uh, carbohydrate to do it or something. I don't know. I mean, it's like it's going to be really tough to do 500th of an inch. But that's how perfect these guys were. Um, then, you know, like he's saying that this black rock, which I forgot has a name, I, I'll, I'll maybe show it on the screen. It has, um, it comes from a long ways away. And, you know, there's this thing of like, why? I mean, think, think about the logistics of the whole thing. So you're a pharaoh in Egypt. So, do you leave Egypt or not? I mean, you're the guy in charge. Leaving Egypt back in the day was not like, I'm just going to go on a little day trip. I'm going to get on a G5. I'm going to fly to London, eat lunch, come back home because I'm super rich. If you left, you left for weeks. And so someone has got to leave Egypt like as a citizen, find this crazy rock that's extremely heavy and really hard right? Seven or above. And then get a sample of it. Some, someone will break off, right? And you bring it back to the pharaoh and you go, man, you know that black box collection you'd like to create? You know, well, look at this. I can get a bunch of this. And the pharaoh's going to be sitting there going, okay, that, that looks awesome. Um, how far away is this? Oh, it's like, uh, it's like six months away, <laughs> you know, whatever it takes to travel to Turkey. Let's just say they got it from there. He is not sure where it comes from. And then how heavy is this going to be? Oh, man, it's going to be like a thousand tons to two thousand tons. It'd be great. And what's the Pharaoh going to say? What year is it? You know, 20,000 BC, 30,000 BC, 40,000 BC. Sure. Yeah. I'll send a couple of my, my cousins. They're really strong. It's not going to happen. You know, where is someone going to say, well, can't we make out of something that's in our backyard? Oh, but you deserve the best, sir. <laughs> it's like, I find those decisions to be just as baffling as how the pyramids were built in the first place. Like that someone would go and grab these exotic rocks that are extremely heavy. And then you're going to have to, because eventually you have to carve this thing, right? So the idea is that you're not going to carve the black box in Turkey. So, Ask Michelangelo how big David was before he made David out of the rock. How heavy was it before he cut away stone? And how heavy is David after he cut away the stone? I've always heard in my lifetime, at least two thirds of the rock is cut away to make any Venus de Milo or any statue that you have. You always need more rock because you can't put it back on, you know? But if you, like, for instance, if you did Dave a little bit wrong, you could go down further and cut away everything that you did to make it right again, you know? So this black box is going to have to be, if it's a thousand tons today, it's going to be at least 2000 tons volumetrically to give yourself some wiggle room in case you make a mistake. 
you don't want to transport the thing after you've mitered all the edges because someone bumps it and, oh my God, I'm going to kill you because we'll never get this edge back. You have to take it down another inch or two, right? Which is the whole thing being redone back down to another level. Oh my God. So someone had to bring these rocks, these massively heavy rocks. I mean, again, what, I know Egyptians had boats that were phenomenal and all that kind of stuff, but there's a there's an interesting equation I've heard several times, which I can't remember the exact math on it, but there's a whole calculation for the displacement of water versus the payload that's inside. Um, sure, you could maybe crane, maybe that big rock into the belly of a battleship and you'd be okay. But uh, ancient pre-dynastic era, mm, I'm not buying that. There's water that you have to get over. You know, there's little tiny land arteries, maybe. So that's a huge question before fabrication starts. Getting these rocks. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure the dude who figured out how to get it over to Egypt got some uh, special reward. But then you have, you know, everything takes time. A lot of effort. Egypt's a little bit more civilized, right? In terms of, well, if not massively civilized compared to these other more primitive areas like a Machu Picchu where it's like, you know, it's really cool. It's, it's amazingly innovated, but you know, it doesn't have a full ecosystem up there. It kind of does and it kind of doesn't, right? We have to think about what all these rooms would be to build an ecosystem. Whereas Egypt's like, oh yeah, there's the, there's the temple, there's the hospital, there's the residence, there's the power supply. What else do you want to know? You know, there's the trade routes all down the Nile. If you're a pharaoh and you die, they take you down to the Valley of the Kings. It's awesome. Luxor, you got to see it. So with the, um, the Petra, it seems like a very unforgiving land. Again, we have to assume that, that the floods were occurring constantly while this place was being built. Uh, it's just nature. It's going to rain. And then there's this giant cataclysmic fire thing which is very surgical it's not like the um you know the theories of killing the make-believe dinosaurs okay fires happen everywhere and so geologists always um, draw false conclusions in my opinion because they'll go to montana they'll go to the grand canyon they'll go all over the world and they'll always there's always a sedimentary layer that's burned and like, see, all this is the same thing. And it's like, it's not the same thing necessarily, right? What would happen if you had a cataclysmic fire burn out, you know, the Rocky Mountains and then it settles and then Earth grows up on top of all that sedimentary stuff? And of course, millions of years, it pushes down and gets crushed into the rock and you have this massive layer of carbon. So as, you know, if you go on this journey, uh, perhaps triggered by this video to to get, oh yeah, I really like that stuff. I'm going to dig into it. My advice to you is to say, one, any man-made history that you've ever been taught about this kind of stuff, you might just want to toss it out the door. Two, be careful with ice age theories, you know, halting man's development. Again, go just do yourself a favor. Go look up why they think ice ages occurred. Then, Remind yourself where Egypt is, at the belt of the Earth's biggest gravitational area, right? Or sorry, diamond, uh, diameter area, right? No need for that to ever occur. Two, remember that trophies are important to societies. Just as bad as Egypt might be today in claiming a pre dynastic. Uh, African society or alien society, building all these amazing things. Same goes for all the European countries and the Americas. Nobody wants to lose their trophy. And so a lot of history has been simply designed to ensure that your kind is the winner of all innovation. And... You know, someone could definitely say, okay, I've got a, I've got an iPhone and that beats the pyramid. Um, the only difference is we know how the iPhone was built. People go to Coral Castle and go, meh, whatever, just a bunch of rocks, whatever. <laughs> They're overlooking 
the fact that no one on planet Earth in his entire lifetime said that they helped him take a stone off a truck. But everyone who brought him a, a stone on the back of a truck said, yeah, he made us go around the corner and he took the rocks off the truck by himself. Oh, and then he moves it like 25 miles after he finishes it. So there's a lot of room for us to consider a lot of different theories on how things work. If the Coral Castle dude was truly using his, um, his magnetic wheel as a stimulant to a rock to infect it, to be more permeable to ethereal, ethereal winds, to then make it more weightless. And somehow the pyramid, or sorry, the, you know, the pyramid builders had figured out a lesser means of creating electricity that then could be used to create a bigger means of creating electricity, right? So all of you have seen a little generator. Well, a little generator could start a bigger generator, you know. There could be some, some sort of uh, connection theory to that as well. The interesting thing, I just want to make another final point about the fire thing. And again, it doesn't really matter if his, he called it a silver plasma burst from the sun. And what's funny about that, if you've watched all my shows, is that I'm always saying to you that, you know, we don't need to worry about coronal mass ejections because there's never been a place on earth that's ever been scorched in the past that we need to worry about them actually doing anything more than interrupting a few, you know, communication satellites. Um, you know, he mentioned the dude that came up with that theory. I do believe that the scorching from the sun theory, I mean, unless there's something about this silver plasma theory, I do not understand. Um, you know, earth is super teeny tiny, right? If the sun was a basketball, then, uh, Earth is a third of a period on a piece of paper. So if there's any massive coronal mass ejection against the Earth, Earth could be completely vaporized if it didn't have a Van Allen belt protecting it, right? So I think that if there was any plasma discharge, it would be coming from the bowels of the Earth, probably because they had power units that could be overwhelmed. You know, what if you created an artery? Let's just say your Tesla. And you're creating his uh, Tesla tower, which again, puts a little bit of amperage into the earth and sucks out infinite amperage up. Volts, whatever you want to measure that by. And then what we didn't understand, maybe he didn't understand, is that the, in the core of the earth is very dynamic and can give us surges. And so his tower vaporizes one day because the way that the core aligned, aligned with his aqua ravine with his plateau, with his antenna, just overwhelmed the thing and just blew it up. So maybe, um, you know, the, the pyramids have been stripped of their outer coating. And I would say that um, now, after listening to Forrester, and I hope, again, he goes over to the, uh, back to the pyramids before his last four and a half hours I got to watch. What if these things simply were too aggressive in design and those outer stones were uh, vaporized, were blown off the unit? Uh, my theory prior to this episode is that they were dismantled, right? They always told you this ridiculous theory when I was a kid that the stones on the outside of the pyramids were taken off to build other structures. And again, without some logic in your brain as a child, you swallow that and you find out that that's um, complete bunk. Because the outer stones of the pyramid were these mitered, angled stones that were meant to lay on top of flat stones, but put a curved edge on the outside, except the Great Pyramid, which actually has slanted stones internally. But still, the outer coating of these pyramids were slanted stones. What the hell are you going to build with that? You can't do anything but build another pyramid at exactly that angle. And I do know the pyramids are actually um, four corners pushed together. I mentioned that, I think, way back five years ago. And then a lot of my friends are like, well, did you know that these pyramids are made out of these different different edges? And then when the sun hits at a particular time of day, you can actually see the creases down the walls. And you're like, hell yeah. It's absolutely phenomenal when you see it. So I'd be, you know, interested in what you guys think. 
I think that um, what we have to gain is several fold, which is, I think the, 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 one of the most intriguing parts about the whole game is that if history was erased, why and to whose advantage? Two, beyond anything I've said here, two, who were these folks? And what can we deduce about their capabilities based on what they built? Again, if they have diamond bit drills, and I mean, there's some of these structures that have little one inch drills uh, where someone was building something, they stopped building it for some reason, and they had little, um, it was about a um, couple matchboxes right next to each other. Uh, and it was going to be this embossed thing in the lid. And someone had drilled one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten holes directly down into this lid, but they're all still round drills. You can still see it. They never went in there and chopped it out and cleaned it up. So, you know, I mean, did they leave? Did they just pick up and go one day and go, we're done here? Did they have a war a long time ago? And this, maybe this burn mark is some weaponry. Uh, it just, it's just interesting. I mean, Petra is really phenomenal, uh, bizarre place to live. Machu Picchu, very lush land, plenty of cropland, and you can infer all kinds of wild things in Peru. But Peru has those drawings that you can only see if you're in a hot air balloon or, or higher. <laughs> you know, it's just like, how could this exist and then go away? and then be rediscovered later. Just all the time. It's everywhere. And I guess the other big question would be, at the end of all of these amazing cultures and these technical societies, you know, did they, um, like, you know, what would have made them just quit what they're doing? Almost like those weird stories of the villagers that just disappear, but their food is still, you know, cooking on the stove or something, you know. So if you have other theories and other videos that you would recommend, please link them down below because that would be really good for me to complete this. Uh, I didn't think I would ever, well, I didn't say ever, but I didn't think it would be so soon that someone would be introduced into the game that really sparks my mind. But this Brian uh, Forrester guy is... Uh, a new breed of archaeologists that, uh, again, for my money, the way he speaks is clear as a bell, just riveting. So um, definitely have a look at the video down below. And uh, that's a good segue to if you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. All the links are up there to video, um, to audio. I have five social media now because we have a parlor in there. Don't know if parlor going to survive. We'll find out. There's the uh, couple ways to contribute, which is Patreon and PayPal. There's also um, the all new remastered season one with the, the store. And so this summer, again, I've got uh, some stuff on Photoshop I'm working on right now to uh, get up there. And so you should have some more opportunities to create some cool, get some cool swag from the show. Anyway, take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now. Thank you.